Hello, my friends. Perlo Wisdom here from BPOW Picks. I'm a professional sports handicapper that just loves, loves, loves hockey. And uh, I've been doing analy I do analytics every year for the upcoming season. I spend sometimes two, three hours a day just going over analytics from the year before. And in doing so, I like to do grades for each NHL team. Today we're going to be looking at the Detroit Red Wings. If you uh, have seen my previous ones, we did the Nashville Predators, we did the Chicago Blackhawks, we're kind of going on teams with the most cap room starting out that way. Let me first say that Stevie Eisenman is one of my favorite humans to ever live in the land, but I don't know. Lately, some of the moves he's been making it's a little bit of a head scratcher, but I'll give a grade and I'll look at my projections. I'm going to look, show you some analytics from Jay Fresh. Not the only analytic guy that I use, but um, my favorite one for sure and the one I use the most. So we'll be looking at his analytics for some players and some of the moves that they made and uh, giving a grade. So let's take a look. I want to keep, got lots to unpack here. Starting off with Alex Dabrinkat, we got to look at that, right? His uh, his analytics from last year were a little kind of unnerving in a sense. Uh, his offense dipped, as we know, when he went to Ottawa. Now he from Chicago. Now, I mean, you can chalk that up that he goes to a city that he probably knows he's not going to be staying at. New teammates, new environment, new everything, family moving. It's a little bit difficult, and uh, you know he didn't have his greatest year. But the real part where the part where he really had his poorest year, as you can see here, was even strength defense, um, big time drop from the year before. And uh, now the year before that, he was also fairly low as well, but he improved and then dropped again. Now Ottawa, if you look at their players. A lot of their players were not good defensively last year. So that could be coaching. That could be a lot of things. I have a feeling that that is likely going to improve this year with Detroit and the overall game of Dabrinkat. Um, 7 point million, 7.9 million for a guy who scored 40 goals at one time is not bad. For four years, he's only 25 years old. I don't mind this deal at all. I certainly think that they needed something like that because they did they had trouble scoring last year so overall i think it was a fine deal um especially for what they gave up they you know uh kubalik like whatever <laughs> it was not a it, it wasn't much to give up for for alex to brink out at all ottawa pretty much kind of just got screwed it was a late first round draft pick that might turn into a 2025 um i do the deal all day is what i'm saying so big plus for that um they bought out zadina and uh they let Pius Suter go, which I'm a little bit, okay, there wasn't much of a spot for him, but I thought he was pretty good and some, in a lot of ways better than some of the players that they did keep, but it was pretty obvious that what they were doing here was trying to improve their size in Detroit. Now, Alex Dabrinkat, of course, doesn't add to that, but other players that we're about to talk to do. He's going to be, Alex Dabrinkat is also going to be playing with uh, Dylan Larkin, who is one of the finest in the land analytically. He is um, great, a fantastic two-way centerman. I'm sure he's going to help to bring out to be able to uh, drive the offense, which to bring out already does, and uh, help him with defensively as well. I Larkin's the kind of guy that pretty much anybody who plays with him seems to get better defensively. His even strength defense was at is at sixty one percent. For a guy who puts up who who um, runs the offense as well as he does, that's not bad at all. Nothing wrong with sixty one percent even strength defense, and uh, I think overall he's going to help to bring out be better than he was last year. Not to mention to bring out's going to be in just a happy place. He's from Michigan. He has, he's only 22, I believe, 20, or sorry, he's 25 years old, and he already has children and is married. 
and his grandparents live in Detroit. So I don't blame him a bit for wanting to be around the grandparents and the family in Detroit. So I think he's going to be in a much happier place. We're going to see Robbie Fabry come back and um, his analytics don't look good. I won't show it to you right now. I'll go over it really quick. But a uh, reason why I'm not showing is his analytics don't look good right now, but he's been fighting an injury for two years. A healthy Robbie Fabry is probably going to look a lot better than what his analytics may show. Now, the big acquisition and one that they got a lot of flack for in Detroit was JT Comper for $5,100,000 for five years. It does sound a bit steep when you first look at it, right? Um, now, uh, and I thought so too. I thought, geez, that seems steep. So we'll look at his analytics here. He, offensively, he doesn't drive offense very well, but he's borderline elite even uh, on even strength defense. I didn't even realize this when I looked. When I like, I usually look at eye tests first, and then I go over analytics later, and then I relook at it again so I can become uh, more. I have less biases when I when I study players. But his even strength defense is fantastic. Um, he would be in there with the with Coleman, Pajos, guys like that. And at that rate, with that kind of defense, $5 million isn't bad. It's the question is, how much does it really help the team as Detroit is structured? His um, offense also improved last year in Colorado. So... He could still at 28 years old have some off have some uh, upside offensively, but as you can see, his goals per 60 were just above average, and is not he's not really a huge playmaker. That being said, I don't mind the signing as a whole. Um, now that I look at it at five million, it's kind of the market for what you want what you're going to get for a guy that plays like he does. Now, he's going to be playing, though, with a guy, with uh, Lucas Raymond, who is only 21 years old. And if we look at his analytics, where he needs where he needs to improve, I mean, they're good for his, his uh, age. Obviously, he had a bit of a, uh, yeah, 30%. Uh, he's got a 58% war. He had a big drop last year in offense, which is common when with the old sophomore slump and people are paying attention to you more and you have to learn to play the game a little different and all of that. And I think Lucas Raymond will, will figure it out. And having a guy like JT Confer there that plays extremely good defense may just help him out a lot more than we think. It may not have been a bad move overall. And I have to admit, when I first saw that move, I was unsure, but I'm going to give it some time. Um, they also picked up, they picked up so many players. One thing is for sure, JT Confer is way better than Andrew Kopp. Um, I didn't like that signing when they made it, and I'm not that big of a fan of it today. Now, that being said, um, he's been playing second line minutes, and I, I've been saying quite for quite a long time now that Andrew Kopp is not a second liner, and he's struggled. I think if he plays third line and preferably on the wing, although they have him as a center here and on cap friendly, um, you could see all these numbers go up quite a bit, especially his even strength offense. I think he's just been playing a little higher competition than he is made out to be. The problem is he's making 5.6 million, which is more than Comfort, and he doesn't produce anywhere near as much as Comfort does. So I didn't like the signing to begin with. But as it turns out, he could be an overpriced, solid third liner. We'll see how that turns out. Um, Christian Fisher, he's just basically adding size here. He's not a spectacular player. And this is kind of what I meant about Stevie Eisenman. Uh, I thought he was a huge analytics guy, but uh, the, more he, the more I look at it, the more I'm starting to think that he's not. Um, uh, his even strength offense and defense was not very good. Uh, projected war 30%, meaning that 30% of 70% of the league would be better than Christian Fisher as your third line winger. That's what that that's what that means. And I don't think that's going to get any better. I say that while well, he played in Arizona, but that's what these analytics are for: is to project 
to take those um, contexts out. That's why I don't like plus minus and all that kind of stuff like that. They they generally don't add in context to um, the way the player is. His war percentile actually improved. He actually improved greatly last year. So it's possible that Stevie Eisenman and their group see a lot of upside from Fisher as a late bloomer. We'll take a look at that. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on that because I love Stevie Eisenman and I just have to do that. Um, but he plays with Michael Rasmussen and Andrew Kopp. It's an, not the greatest third line. Michael Rasmussen is still figuring it out at 24 years old. He does have good size. I'm not going to look at his analytics to save time, but they're about the same as Kopp and Fisher. I would have rather have seen Klim Koshton up there. Um, Daniel Sprong was a nice pickup in the Klim Koshton deal. I, lo I, I like Klim, Klim Koshton. He had one of his better years last year, or he an improved year last year, and he improves just about every year. That's what I like about him, and he's only 24 years old. He's big. He's fast. He's got all the tools to be a good player. He's as a fourth liner, he's he's project he's he's better than half of the league, and I think he's got the upside to do even better than that. And he's got some untapped goal scoring there too. He's got a great shot, good speed, not the greatest vision in the world, but he's the kind of guy that can go, can uh, take a puck to the net and score and pot a couple for you. Uh, I think he will probably move up the lineup myself. Um, down the road here, Daniel Sprong. I actually like this move. Um, he's not a very good defensive player, but he has this weird way of being able to know how to make, he's not bad, 39% for on, on the fourth line. He might even be able to move up, but his even strength offense, he drives a line down in the lower lines really well, and he produces really good offense in the lower lines. When you put him up to the higher lines, he tends to lose it, mostly because he needs the puck. And when he's playing on the lower lines, the other players he plays with usually don't really want the puck. They just want to get it to someone. So I like this move for only $2 million for one year. I thought it was great. He, he had some really good numbers. Look at his goals per 60, 97%. A five on five, fantastic. But look at this, his competition is low. So he's had minutes that were protected. He plays protected minutes. But in those protected minutes, he actually does fairly well. Now we'll look at the defensive side of things really quick. There's so much happened here. In uh, I'm not going to look at the uh, analytics for Wallman and Sider for the sake of time. But Sider at 22 years old is at about a 76% war, which is fantastic for a 20-year-old defenseman especially a right defenseman. Jake Wallman went nuts last year and has improved every year. I love this guy. He's turning into a pretty much an elite defensive defenseman. But after that, things get ugly. And this is what I do want to show you about because uh, I know a lot of people like these big players and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I like big players as well. It's always a bonus to have a big, big players for sure. But look at the war of Ben Chirot. I know I did not understand this pickup by Stevie Eisenman when he signed him. 4.8 million. Um, he shouldn't be playing, he shouldn't be playing second pair of minutes, not even close. He's actually better offensively than defensively. He overhits, he pinches when he's not supposed to. He doesn't seem to know what the puck to do with the puck a lot of the time when he when it's on a stick. I just, I'm not a fan of this player. And honestly, he was better the year before offensively than he is now. And a little bit better defensively. He had an absolutely brutal year last year. Even when they even when they did sign him, though, he wasn't worth this much. And um, he seems to be regressing at quite a bit. Also picked up Hall, who... Um, Got slammed in uh, Toronto quite a bit, but he's actually not a bad defensive player. And as a second pair guy, he's average. He's your average defenseman. The thing is, is if you're going to play him with Ben Chirot, I think all of these numbers could go to poop because Ben Chirot is very difficult to play with, um, which tells you that I'm not a fan of their second pairing if they keep it as it is. I would actually rather, and it was a nice pickup of Shane Gosh Despair, who has 
been a late blooming player as far as this whole game is concerned, his complete game, but he's worked hard at it and he's improved himself to be not bad, not a bad player at all, actually. He's a good shooter. His goals for 60 by, by a defenseman is really good. Even straight defense for an offensive guy isn't that bad, actually. Um, and that's playing on a second pair. Here they have him on the third pair. I would rather move Hole over to the other side and put Gosh Spear there and bring Sherratt down. To me, that would be a better pairing, but we'll see what he decides to do. As you can see, his defense improved greatly last year. It was the best defensive year he's had, which could mean at 30 years old, he's hitting his stride. And you're just going to get a better and better player for the next two or three years. So I did really like this pickup. Um, finally, uh, we've got Ole Mata, who, again, I would take him and put him on the fourth, oh, oh, uh, put him on the second pairing over Sherratt. He's about a 60% defensive player. He's, again, pretty average. This is a pretty average defense besides the top two. Then... The other thing I wanted to bring up, a few things here. Elmer Soderblom, um, while well, we'll look at Elmer Soderblom, I would play him up further in the lineup. I would actually play him over Christian Fisher, to tell you the honest truth. Um, and Bergeron why, they Bergeron, why they have him as a scratch, I don't know. He's got to be in the lineup somewhere here. He can take out Rasmussen. He can take out all. He can take out Cop, to tell you the honest truth. His upside is very, very good for a 23-year-old. Um, and I think if they do that, sometimes I think that teams can get a little too crazy when it comes to size and aggression when you're looking at just obvious improved analytics. Look at this, 83% war. Now playing as a fourth liner, he's ready for the third line. And he's a big boy. He's six some years old, uh, six foot six, I think. Um, yes, he doesn't play overly aggressive, but he plays very good positionally. Um, he, he's learning how to use his size better. I think he takes over one of those spots fairly quick. Um, and maybe that's the thing. Maybe that's what Detroit or what uh, what um, Stevie Eisenman is doing. He possibly is bringing in guys to say, look, if you can't beat these guys, you can't play. Guys like Fisher, um, they he can they can use to a trade at the dead, to trade at the deadline to pick up some picks. If guys like Jonathan Bergeron, who didn't have like a spectacular year last year as far as pure um, analytics are concerned, but he has improved greatly and he's improving very very fast. Um, I have a feeling he'll move up the lineup fairly quick. That's why he's got a 70% war and uh, will probably just have a really good year. I feel like he's going to have a really good year. So, overall, I would grade this as a C plus um, because there's just a lot of confusing moves here. And I may turn out to look at the end of the year and go, oh, this all makes sense now. But... At this point, it looks like that Stevie Eisenman just basically made himself one top line and three third lines um, that are going to have a difficult time scoring. Uh, still, I still think they're going to have a difficult time scoring, maybe be a little better defensively. And they didn't improve their goaltending at all. Hosa really didn't have a great year last year. James Reimer had a terrible year last year, and he's not very good. He's not much better than... Um, the goaltenders that they let go in Nedeljkovic. Um, a little bit better, but not not really all that much better. I think they're going to barely, I think they're going to miss the playoffs again. I don't see a playoff here for Detroit. Tell me what you think in the comment section. And uh, thanks for listening, everybody. My Our next team will we will be looking at is... the Buffalo Sabres, who I think are probably going to be the ones to beat them out. Okay, have a good day, everybody. Okay, bye.